Hey everybody, heavy hitter alert. We got the epitome, record man is too limited. We have the epitome of a music man. Stay tuned, you're, you know where you're at. It's Pensado's place. Hi everybody, been a fun week, been a good week. Glad to have you back. Um, uh, man, we got, we got emails from India this week, Herb, uh, Brazil, um, uh, Sweden. Man, it's like an international week on Facebook this week. It's pretty cool. It's I pretty cool. I looked, I looked at our analytics and we just passed 33, 34 countries. So, kudos You've to you guys. have been that for five weeks, Herb. They, we don't pass a country a day. <laughs> <laughs> let, let it grow. It's and, evolving. And Panorama City is not a country, right? Depends. Okay. Depends on your perspective <laughs> and if you're caught there late at night. But that's another story. <laughs> I, I've been through there. I ride my. I, well, I'm not gonna digress. I, okay. ride my, I drive my Harley through there. Cool. I love. I love that little town. I forget the name of it. But uh, so how was you been? How was your week? I was gonna ask you first. Man, you know, just tough week in the studio. Uh, Drew broke my broke my Pro Tools oh, wow. yesterday. <laughs> right. What's up with that? It was Drew. like that when I got to it. Huh? I, don't, I was like that when I got to it. I don't know what, what happened. Skit, Saturday Night Live skit. What's up with that? What's up with that? And yeah, so anybody that I'm mixing for right now, I'm uh, temporarily down for a second. So let's get some stuff done. Um, guys, you know the drill. Uh, we talk to you on Facebook all the time. We look at your comments. We, we thank you for those, and we react to those, and all of us answer them. So you see about the page right now. Facebook, you hit us at Twitter, at Pensado's Place, and you know to go to the YouTube channel to find us. And we always want to welcome our strategic partners, Vintage King. Hey, Vintage King. I think who do we have in the chat room? Oh, we got Jeff Leibovich in the chat room, so he'll be answering questions. So big shout out to you guys. That's good stuff. We're going to tease you, you know, listen, as our audience, you're going to start to get bountiful in a minute. We've got some stuff for you later, but we'll tell you about that later. Lots of good stuff. Um, stay tuned, and I think we don't hesitate. Why take up our time? Let's get to our guest. I guess that's not too subtle a cue for what I'm supposed to do next. They, I thought they, we rehearsed this. They, they don't want us. They want him. In rehearsal, I had, like, like ladies and things and I edit every one of those all the time. Yeah. We don't do rehearsals, I guess you know that, but it's fun to pretend, right? It's yeah. like the live audience that we have every week. It's yeah, fun to pretend. Absolutely. Man, I got to tell you guys if I say man again, just bitch slap me her, but uh I love this guy so much. He's gotten me through some of the best times of my life and a couple of the worst. And I owe him so much. I I wouldn't be here in front of you if it weren't for his generosity and trust in me and uh his name's Ron Fair, needs no introduction, even though I'm going to make an attempt. But uh, you guys know Ron. Um, the hat he's wearing today is not the only one he normally wears. He's, he's probably the only cat I know, and I use the term cat respectfully and, and, and purposely, that has pretty much mastered every part of the process of making music. I mean, Ron started when he was 16 years old, and, and his story is fascinating. I'm not going to bore you with it. Do like Herb and I did in Google Ron Fair, and you'll find it. But Ron, thank you so much thank for you, Dave. being on the Herb, show. Ron, a couple of old that. friends, Absolutely. my old homies here. Absolutely. Uh, one of the questions on the on the live chat was, "How does Ron find time to do this?" Ooh. And and man, I, I I know that you're in a busy part of your life, and and uh, I've known you 20 years, and I've never seen a, a non-busy part of your life. So uh, I, I take it as a personal uh, favor to me that you've done this for me. I really no, appreciate my, it. I'm thrilled to be here, man. So, Great. let's just jump right in. Um, everybody knows the, all the great records you've done, but maybe we can kind of give them a little bit of insight into into. I know how how you a, approach a record, and for example, like uh, my arm fell off again. I do that once a show. For example, like uh, let's just pick anything at random, like "Be Without You." Uh, when you first hear a song like that, do you hear what's missing? Do you hear what's there and try to amplify it? Do you hear... Well, Be Without You, is a, <clears throat> it's a great story. We could do a whole class just to Be Without You because of its, uh, of its, uh, its life story from when uh, Mary recorded the song, uh -huh. when it was turned in originally, how it sounded, how it was denied, 
and how I came to be involved. So I'll leave all the record biz politics out of this yeah. version of the story, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about the music. Yeah. So when um, when we identified, actually what happened was one of the guys at the label had played me the song and said, what's wrong with this record? Why doesn't anybody get it? And I wasn't really uh, working on Mary's project. I didn't know her. I had a different position. Mm -hmm. But I said, well, are you looking, what are you looking for in terms of my response? And they said, we want a real musical breakdown. I said, okay, well, let's break it down in music theory. First of all, she's singing the wrong chords in the chorus. Yeah. The harmonization, she's doing three-part harmony, but they're the wrong notes. Yeah. She's singing chords that she's hearing in her head, but they do not correspond with the music that's being played on the record. Second of all, it's an eight-bar loop that's been cut and pasted through the entire song, but the eight-bar loop is not going through the correct changes that the song is. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's the bar, first of all, bar eight at the end of the chorus, or the halfway point of the chorus, or bar 16 of the chorus, is not the same as it is in bar eight and bar 16 in the verse. So none, basically the, um, the way that the song was, was produced, and it was, still as, it was still a song demo. It was never really fully cooked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and part of our stock and trade, our racket, basically, we present music to people. We play, our job is to make the music and play it for people, yeah. and then we got to elicit a reaction and therefore commerce. So when, peop when this original version of Be Without You was played, people would, were blankly staring at it in space and not reacting to the song. Okay, now this is a song that went on to become the longest running number one record in the history of Billboard R&B chart, 14 weeks. The previous record was 13 weeks set by Charles Brown in 1949, mm -hmm. and five weeks at number one in pop, and it was a gigantic worldwide smash. The same record that nobody heard. Okay, so they asked me for my musical breakdown, I tell them, is she singing the wrong chords? Uh, bar eight, bar 16, all of the turnaround bars were all uh, part of this cut and paste, um, and there was a lot of other issues uh, in terms of what happened on the bridge. The music for the verse that was the same as the music for the chorus became the same music in the bridge. Stuff that was basically um, aspects of the original demo. So in, in what I did, with, which I've done a lot, it was a composite style of production where, to begin with, you have to honor and love and obey the song. Mm -hmm. So. The, the song was written by um, Brian Michael Cox and, and, and uh, John Tay Austin. Mm. And the, to me, I heard the song in my head. I knew what an incredible song it was. But in terms of the production of the record, they, they didn't see it through all the way. It wasn't fully done. So that message got repeated to Mary. Mm -hmm. Like, Ron says you're singing the wrong chords. Ron says bar 8 and bar 16 <laughs> are... are well, we know me. So, so Kendu, Isaacs, her, her manager and slash husband, who's also a musician and drummer, he called me up and he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, what do you mean what am I talking about? I'm, talk, I'm telling you, she's singing the wrong chords in the chorus. She's singing three-part harmony, but they're not the chords that the, that the piano's playing. So it's, mm -hmm. not, it's, not, it's not working. He said, I don't understand. I said, it's not laced. And he goes, well, what, what do you do? What, what, what should we do? I said, you got to redo it. You, gotta, you can't just change it. She's got to resing it. She's got to resing the chorus. She's got to sing the right harmony. And, and by the way, bar eight, bar six, I went through my little music police mm -hmm. uh, definition of where I thought the demo and the cut and paste process had failed the, the realization of the song. So he said, well, can you come to New York and work on it with me and Mary? And it was like, wow, sure, of course. Well, it, there was a lot. I'll skip through the, the blood and guts part of arranging mm -hmm. how all that worked politically. Mm -hmm. And uh, found ourselves in New York. And so first thing we did as a warm-up was all those oohs and parts in the intro, which weren't there. And the little I want to be with you, going to be with you, that was just something that, that I made up on the fly, um, just a sort of a setup. Well, not, knowing, not knowing that Mary... I didn't know her. Right? I mean, not knowing that she was going to like what she was going to like or what she wasn't going to like. I mean, she's a gi she's a giant in my mind. She's Elvis. She's the biggest thing ever, and um, and I was nervous. Uh, but I want to say, uh, for our particular audience and your particular audience, Dave, that the the what gave me the authority to stand in front of Mary J. Blige as a white Jewish guy and say, "Sing this," was the years I did with the OJ's. Wow. And if it wasn't for Eddie Levert and uh, Walt yeah. Williams in one ear and you know Eddie on this ear and Walt on this ear, yeah. I wouldn't have had the authority to know which way is north 
to even speak to somebody of the stature of Mary J. Blythe. So anyway, we, we, we touched up. We, she didn't sing everything over, but she sang the chorus over. She put the, we, did, we created the new intro. Uh, and then I went about my business with the late Tal Hertzberg of microsurgically repairing only the parts that I felt were leaving the song, were not delivering the song. So Brian Michael Cox's original law that he laid down the law was always there. I didn't throw any of the bathwater out. I only fixed the stuff, only the clams, because the original feel and the original vibe and the original intention was correct and was all there. So there was a, there's a lot of levels involved in a composite production where you don't just chuck out the good shit. You've got to keep the good shit. and you, you have to know like what to change. And then part of that experience, which ended up leading me into a relationship with Kendu and Mary that, that made her her really, I think, her biggest album of her career, which was The Breakthrough, mm -hmm. we did nine songs together on that album, mm -hmm. um, was the way that Kendu and Mary uh, always were, the, Kendu used to, he used to beat me up, we were like the odd couple, um, because he said, you're, sh you're shining the shit up too much, you're, you're, you're polishing it too much, you gotta leave the hump. And aspects of the hump that I wouldn't know, like, I didn't grow up listening to the music that they did. Mm -hmm. um, so aspects of the hump, like, I don't know what they're talking about. So by attrition, by little by little, but they, I would polish and they would whittle back. And then we found that balance of like, leave, the, leave that, that distortion you're trying to clean up on the bass. That's the shit that's hip. That's the shit we need. It's like, well, to me, it's wrecking the harmony and it's pulling down the, the melody and like, who cares, man? Leave that, we need that distortion. So I, ga I, I trained my gaze on just the areas that, uh, that would make a difference. The vocal arrangement, the, 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 the level of her voice, the harmonization, the, the penetration of the song, the idea of the song, and I let the other stuff that the original producers had done, let it be and stop listening to it. Like, okay, if these guys are telling me that the drums are the shit, I'm not gonna argue. Mm -hmm. right. they, okay, so let's assume they are the shit. Now let's deal with the song. Right. How come the chorus isn't knocking me out? So in that style, we ended up doing nine records over we sold millions of copies, we got nine Grammy nominations, we won three that night, she had a triumphant night. Uh, one of the great experiences of my life. And, and um, you mixed the record, Dave, and we were in there in the trenches, and Mary and Kendu were back at home listening in their home studio, and I remember there was a piano lick that I did in the, um, in the bridge, I remember. and uh, Kendu hated it. He, it. It was like one, like one little bar of where I stretched and played like something that was, excuse the expression, jazzy. And Kendu hated it, and he called me up and he said, man, the whole thing's fucking bullshit, it sucks, get rid of that shit. And then with, until we figured out how to speak to each other, which we did, um, and then I removed that part, and I was like, well, that's my favorite part. But it was all a learning process for me because in, you know, in making urban records or, or you know, records where Mary J. Blige's truth is the most important thing, it has to be kosher for her. So uh, what I, I learned a lot from it, of course it was a great success and um, you know, one of our big successes, Dave, probably the biggest one. And, um, and I love the record and, and then we flew the lick at the end, uh, the big ad lib, I said, we gotta come back, man, we gotta, that lick has to come back and we need the big finish. And um, I remember you got mad at me for the distortion at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and then we turned a record in, and of course it was like people were saying, well, where'd that song come from? It was like, well, you always had it. It just didn't sound like this. Right. And, um, and there was always a, you know, there was a lot of, a record that big that generates that much business, there was a lot of dissension about like, well, what did Ron Fair really do? And what is he taking credit for? And like all kinds of nonsense around it. But the original, you know, the, the main thing is, and I, and I want to say it on the record, was that what I did was always done for love beyond anything else. First of all, for the song. Absolutely. Second of all, for Mary and honoring her, her you know, what she brings to it. Mm -hmm. And it was a privilege to work on it. And, um, you know, one of the big hits of my life. Yeah, everything I've ever ever been to say, you, you know, I've had done. We might, I might can even say hundreds of things together now because yeah. we've been working twenty years. But I've never seen you put your personal ego, your personal goals, ahead of the song. You 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 were a song guy at sixteen, and you're a song guy at now. Yeah. And uh, when 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 like like let's go to like say. Um, 
uh, Lady Marmalade or, 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 or Buttons, you just got, uh, you, you, you just, I, I wish I could get you to articulate, because I hear the before and then I hear what you do, and it's surgically, correctly, the, the perfect thing to, to make the song likable. Like, in some circles, the word P.O.P. is a dirty word, but to you, it's a badge of honor. Like, you, you, you come from a jazz background, you were, you were listening to all the great jazz records, and in fact, you still call it, uh, 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 I like to go into my little bubble and stick to my knitting. You, you, you live in a world that, 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 that has produced your ability, I guess, to, to, to hear music different than the rest of us. Like, well, the, the, um, <laughs> the, thing, about, the thing about jazz, which Give me into your creativity. Well, a the, bit. The, because you have to understand what the drug is for me. The drug is is harmony. It's chords. Mm -hmm. The chords are my drug. That's why I love Gershwin. That's why I love Duke Ellington. That's why I love Antonio Carlos Jobim, because of they're they're playing eleven note chords, and the harmonization is that's a drug for me. Who's that guy you told you took me to see one night? Ahmed Jamal. Oh, yeah. 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 He sounds Changed like he life. sounds like a nine hundred pound uh, nine hundred person symphony orchestra with ten fingers. So. So start with that, where I walk into the room and, and um, my drug is chords. But don't forget, I, I, I recorded and mixed Hell Waits by Slayer. Yeah. So I've been through, and like, armored yeah, I've been through so many different genres, but, but the, the wind beneath my wings was, was always the, the chord changes. Like, that's what I got off on. So um, a record like Lady Marmalade has a very similar story. Very similar story to be without you. I just you. talked to Rockwater about Really? It. Yeah. Well, on the way there, I, I was... It was, it's such a crazy story. It, it started with a film company, and um, Baz Luhrmann is the guy who really had the vision for the song, the guy who made Moulin Rouge. And he had the vision for the song that he wanted, like, this super raw underneath to the record, but a very articulated um, top when, in terms of the vocal arrangement. So uh, Jimmy Iovine suggested, like, well, why don't we put Ron in there with Missy Elliott and see what happens? Well. You know, I, I don't know what, I must have rubbed somebody the wrong way because I was on the way to Westlake Studios to do the first vocal session and I got, I really, a, I I got a call and it was like, I was there. Uh, you're, you're not, your services are not, mm. yeah, I might have seen you there. Your services yeah. are not really required here, Ron. We don't really need you to work on this song. Jesus. I was like on the way there. And it was like, uh, broke my heart and it was like, oh, well, shit. You know, everybody always wants to be wanted and I was unwanted. Mm -hmm. So I turned the car around and I got a call like 10 minutes later. No, no, no. Forget that last call. Go to the studio. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. So it was like, all right, this isn't about pride or ego, or whatever. I got a job to do. I have a job to do. And of course, we had lined up at that point um, my good friend, and, you know, I love her. She's a fucking genius. Christina Aguilera had jumped on the record, she was going to sing it. Maya, who was on our label on the home team, Pink, who's, who was like the MVP, incredible, and little Kim, who brought all that flavor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we went over to, uh, to Westlake to, cut the, to start the vocals. Now, interestingly enough, all those girls in a room, who do you think laid the first voulez-vous as the pocket, like who, when we started to stack the vocals? Who do you think laid down the pocket? Christine. Maya. Wow. wow. Christina and Pink were like, they were kind of neutralizing each other a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and um, Maya went in there and laid it down. And she, had, she has a fantastic work ethic yeah. and a great pocket. So whereas her tone may not be the most, you know, wowie zowie tone of all time, but she, she could really, she knew how to record. Mm -hmm. She was a dancer. She knew how to record like Michael Jackson how to record. Like he, she yeah. knew how to take what she had and like put it through the microphone and and had a great pocket. So all of the all of the pocket of all the stacks in Lady Marmalade were all started by Maya. There were a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and then, of course, it was a best of that night because each girl sang their part. And, and uh, when, they, when Christina heard Pink, it was like, well, let me do mine again. <laughs> and then Pink heard Christina, well, let me have it again. So, <clears throat> and that continued for a long time. But that was the first record where um, I realized there's no way that at their level of, of potential that they would be able to create an ad-lib scheme 
with the, interle with the interweaving ad libs without tons of rehearsal, without like, you know, I'll oh, lay out here, you come in on beat the end of three and sing, whoa, you know. There was no way they were gonna be able to ad lib at the level that Baz Luhrmann wanted for the, you know, for, for the, to get the interplay. Uh, and unless I were to let each girl just sing the whole record, ad lib from top to bottom with no regard to the geography, where they're singing, because the song is basically a modal song. It's all da 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 da. It all fits over one tonality, so they can ad lib over the whole track. So three minutes of ad libs, each girl go. Ten tracks of each girl go, and it's like, all right, see you later. I'll harvest. I will now harvest. I'll get out my rake and I'll harvest. So I went through every ad lib, and said, I like this one. I like that, and I put them and and and, and put them in like like a bin, and then assigned each ad lib on a beat so that when you press down a key, it triggered sample cell, which is what we used back then, and it would sing the lick, play the lick back in relation to the beat. He had a keyboard here with a piece of tape on every key. Mm. I had two, I had an L shaped. Yeah, mm. and, and, and had them memorized. Mm. No, no, I didn't memorize them. Oh, I come labeled on, Ron, them. you knew. No, well, you labeled I did, them. I labeled, I named each one. But you, but you were so like, like you and were they like, were different colors. So like Christina's licks were, were green, and, and Maya's licks were, uh, were red and mm. little Kim, even her ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, that mm. was all flown in. So what I would do is I labeled each one like a, a like up down blues or fast button or trail, and I rem then I memorized the names of each one so I knew which licks were which, and then I played the record over and over again like eight bars at a time, and I composed and played the ad libs in off, off keyboard. It took a couple of days, mm. and. Um, and then all of a sudden, like one girl would sing, the next girl would sing, like the ads were branching off each other like a tree, you know? And, uh, and then of course, the girls came in and heard it and then they said, I want to do that one again, I want to do that one again. And Missy didn't like one particular one that Maya sang. And same thing on the, on the track, it was a very simplistic track. Uh, the original was Alan Toussaint. It was a New Orleans thing. It had great horns, great piano, great chords. And this version was really, uh, uh, telescoped on the essence of da 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 and and everything else was eliminated so the musicality of the original which I loved was like okay check that shit at the door this is not about musicality this is about this beat and Rock Wilder had done the beat so he was he was he was inspired to do it a certain way and it was a little too loosey-goosey for my taste like all of the all over the 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 quantization map like shit was ahead, behind, late, all different velocities, like it was really sounded like a mess to me. So I asked Rockwild, I said, you know, would you mind if I have Tal Herzberg like put this on a grid and let's hear how it sounds. And I said, and if it gets too shiny, it's okay, like we'll, we'll, un, we'll uncook it. Mm -hmm. And we did it and Rock, Rockwild said like, that sounds dope, I love it. And he approved everything, you know, the organ. But actually, Robbie Buchanan did just the simple, did like a little gliss. Um, we, add, we changed a few things. And, um, and then, Dave, you mixed it mm -hmm. over, a, I think, five days. It was 220-something inputs on the console. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, the approval process where, you know, lots of people had to approve lots it. Of lots of record companies, lots of artists, lots of heads of labels, lots of producers. Yeah, and in the end, uh, you know, another number one record around the world, number one in America for five weeks. No commercial single was ever released on Lady Marmalade, only the album. Mm. So it was still that, the, those days when you could do that trick yeah. where well, yeah. you had to buy the album, it was tethered, and yeah. it was a double album. So it was a big, big, big win Amazing. about 10 years ago. You know, you know, I want people to know this about you. When Ron gives his word, his word is... Bond, you know, which makes him a rarity. A rarity, <laughs> and Ron cares. I mean, Ron's mm -hmm. one of these cats that just um, Missy had had to go to the Bahamas, and she didn't introduce Kim as little Kim. And <laughs> anybody else, and you and I know the people in the record industry, so I'm speaking from something I know, mm -hmm. would have just said, "Well, that's the way it goes." Mm -hmm. Ron, when little Kim said, "Ron, my name's Little Kim, not Kim." Ron immediately gave his word that that would be corrected. Mm -hmm. Now, n I'm not saying anything negative about Missy. Missy had, had things to do and she was very occupied, but 
Ron made every effort to get Missy to say Lil' Kim, mm -hmm. and he was going to fly that in like he did everything else. But Missy was, I don't know, maybe somewhere, or I can't, I, I, but... It was logistically impossible. It was impossible. To, to, other than having her voice over a phone, we needed a full fidelity, because yeah. she goes, da 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 mm -hmm. Christina, da 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 Pink, da 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 Kim. Right. It was like, no, no, no. it's Lil' little Kim. Kim. Right. <laughs> but Ron gave his word, and... I, I, I can't remember exactly, and I have medical reasons for that, but uh, I can't remember exactly if, if the record was postponed or what, but it was getting close to the end, and Ron found a way to make sure that Little Kim's name was said as Little Kim. But it's the details. I mean, I think... Well, no, Nancy Fletcher, actually. I had not seen her for yeah. years and years and years. I'd signed mm. her when she was in a group called Lipstick. Yeah. Mm. And I hadn't seen her for years and years, and I was walking down the hall at the old Enterprise, yeah. and this beautiful woman, like, walking towards me, Ron Finn, Ron Finn. I'm like, who's this beautiful woman? Right. I should know That's who that problem. is, right? Good problem. She looks like a princess. And she comes up and throws her arms around me. Goes, don't you remember me, Nancy Fletcher? I hadn't seen her in years. I know. And I was like, Oh my God, Nancy! God, you look so beautiful. What, what have you been doing? And she goes, it turns out she sang every hook on every Snoop record oh, since wow. uh, since I saw her. Right. Right. Every right. chick hook on every Snoop record was Nancy Fletcher. Toured with Snoop. That was her. Became her life. Yeah. It's like, well, what are you doing? Well, you know, nothing. Nah, nah, nah. And, she, and she said, If there's, and remember that time you paid my rent, Ron? And remember that time you mm. got my car? out of the tow yard and it was like I don't remember any of that <laughs> and it was like then she said well if there's ever anything that I could do for you just let me know and, you said, and I said bingo can you sound like Missy Elliott exactly. <laughs> I, remember. Exactly. I remember she said what do you mean I said come in here now and we went into into Damon Elliott's old room oh, yeah. and and we listened to Missy going Christina pink man she said and I've never told the story before in public uh, and it was Nancy Fletcher. We just took the word Lil. Yeah, I remember. And she was like, Lil, Lil, Lil. So she got right into Missy's tone, and we just spliced that in. And I asked Missy for her permission. I said, is it okay if I have somebody else do it? Mm. And she's, you know, you got to be really Absolutely. clean with all that. Absolutely. And, and you gave became, your word, And it became And you, and you kept your word. And, I mean, and you, <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Those were trying times, and that was, that was not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Ron, let me ask you. Uh, um, Several times you, you've expressed to me how you felt that um, that music in our culture has has gone through different roles. And recently, in an interview I think you did in England, you, you mentioned that music now has a different role in our society, in terms of like Spotify and Pandora and Mog and some of those. Uh, can you just qu quickly expand on 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 what you think the role of music is now that that can kind of I think the role of music is the same. I just right. think the role of records and the entire record industry and the way that it was consumed. consumed it's kind of like basically, I love to say it this way because it, it, it's so black and white, it's clear. So all this time, we've been making saddles. And we've been making the finest saddles for every kind of ass there is. The, the, the <laughs> economic, the, we have the economy line, we have the very finely honed saddles, hand tan leather, the smoothest ones, the softest ones, the hardest ones, the big ones, the little ones. We make saddles for all of your riding needs. The car just drove up. Right. Nice. Oops. Our factories are made for saddles. There are no more sa there are no more horses. Wow, right? that's deep. Transportation has changed. You hearing that, Drew? Okay. So now the car is driven up. So what do we do with all of our factories that make all these saddles? Well, we go out of business, for one. We, we, we die. Secondly, we adapt. So the, the role of music in its soothing, its uh, aphrodisiac, its f ability to create fun, to create mood, to create everything in our life, that's all the same. To create drama, whatever it is, that music is the, you know, it's the so sauce that lubricates everything. But the consumption of it and the and the replication of it and the you know distribution of it and everything that our record industry had be became as an as an evolved ecosystem that's out the door i love pandora i mean i put it you know when i'm when i'm do just chilling out i'm in the backyard barbecuing or living my life and i can type in uh uh clifford brown oh, wow. right and then all of a sudden they're playing you know, Joe Pass or Art Blakey or, you know, all this related music from the, you know, or, or Hampton Hawes comes on or, you know, just all this amazing stuff that some, 
either there's some great music programmer there or some kooky algorithm that they cooked up that knows right. that Clifford Brown it, it ties into Lee Morgan, ties into Freddie Hubbard. They, you know, I love it. I think it's the great. I think the satellite radio is the greatest product ever. Yeah, me too. Sounds great, you know. Um, I love all the new shit. There's more ways than ever to get and enjoy music, but the old ethos of I want to hold the album and sit here in my house between my speakers and <clears throat> read Jackson Brown's liner notes, toast. That's great. Are you, before you tee that up, let me just get a little bit of stuff out of the way. Guys, um, you know our partners Avid as well. We've got this combo that we're going to give away for five straight weeks. You see what you have. Uh, make sure you enter through your Twitter account. We're going to line it up and get it to you. Like I said earlier, we got a lot of bounty for you, so sorry to interrupt us while you tee it up, but we want to make sure we get it in while folks are watching. Okay. okay? Uh, Ron, I've learned so much from you, and I, I'm not saying that because you're here. I say it when you're not here. Uh, I've said it in print. But one of the things I learned from you was, I don't know if you can articulate this for our engineers in the crowd, but um, Ron, Ron taught me, like, and now that we've got the ability to draw in automation moves like Ron you'll 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 touch every syllable every breath every part of a vocal performance and a lot of times a singer will start the first line of a, of a of an important part of the song and kind of build up ramp up into it mm -hmm. and and Ron taught me how to take that word and, and, and raise the volume of it just and, and manipulate the energy of the song and and Ron called it he'd send me notes Dave, you didn't pimp out the vocal. Pimp out the vocal, and what that meant was well, the the re, the way I work with mixers, what yourself or the you know the handful of guys that I usually use, is I could very easily say to you on the word sunshine, raise it three dB. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I'm not mixing it. You are. So what I want to do is I want to point out that there's an issue, and then I want your hand. Because you're, the whole point of mixing is it's everything in relation to everything else. So nothing is in a vacuum. You change the one word on the, on, on the vocal, all of a sudden the snare drum's not loud enough. All of a sudden you change the snare drum, now the, now the bass is, it sounds funny. Now you change the bass, now the background vocals sound weird. You move this pan, then all of a sudden that pan sounds weird. Everything is in relation to everything else. It's a constant, constant, constant balancing act. Actually, you know, like keeping all the plates spinning. Mm -hmm. So my notes, when I'm giving them to somebody like you as my pal, when I say pimp it out, well, what does that mean? That means you know, get the sexy, get the boobs out, like get the hair going, like Short get skirt. get it, make it sexy, like make it feel like, you know, like you see something walking down the street uh, when when a line hits you. But I can break it down so fine in my ear, and I always, um, you know, I listen to a record once through in an environment, very rarely twice through in the same environment, I will change the environment, and let it wash over me and then put notes down as it goes in real time how it hits me. And uh, one of the things that I felt like when you're talking about the, these type of vocal moves, there's certain um, phys well, it, physical or maybe even physiological uh, aspects. So as a melody descends, or as an ad lib descends, starting on a high note going to a low note, to me, oftentimes in the track, as the melody descends, <coughs> it loses energy. It loses steam as it melodically descends. So we ride it up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and there's always a, um, thanks. There's always a, now why do we do that? Well, in my case, like I'm a vic, I'm, I'm subject to the way I hear it. I'll just keep going and then until it sounds right to me. But the problem is I, I over I will overachieve because the public doesn't really can't really tell a lot of the uh, adjustments that I'm making. That doesn't mean I'm not going to make them. I'm going to make them for me. But um, things like that, like the physiology of how sound hits you when you're listening in relation to other sounds, and and it's so subjective because it's just literally my opinion mm -hmm. that I'm sitting there thinking like the second word of the second line of the second verse. I can't understand it. Mm -hmm. It's completely my opinion. I'm telling you, my audience, you guys listen to listen to Christina's big records, uh, Keisha, um, Vanessa Carlton, um, Pussycat Dolls, Mary, and and study study the vocals and study study 
the the the, the way that Ron guides all the guys that, that he uses uh, on that. Um, do we need to get do we need to get well, to the why don't we Drew, why don't we build in some of our chat room questions into this discussion and see yeah. this time is flying. Yeah, it is. As, uh, we got a lot of questions for you, Ron and uh, Dave. Uh, first for Ron. Ron, with your A&R hat on, how do you balance your gut instinct with what you personally think is great music and what your gut instinct on what you think will sell? Are they different? Do you apply the same rationale when you're producing? So far the same. Whoa, can you condense that? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, sorry. I got distracted. Uh, when, when you got your A&R hat on, how do you yeah. balance your gut instinct? <clears throat> Excuse me. With your gut instinct on what you personally think is great music and your gut instinct of what you think will sell. All right, Are this, they this, different? Is very, this is a very easy answer, okay? And how, how have I managed, managed to, to stay on the surfboard for 30 years? There, to me, I've, I live by this. There is a difference between music and records. Records use music and abuse music. There's no law that says a great record is of great music. And there's no law that says all great music can become a great record. They're two different things. When I'm an A&R guy, my job is to catch a wave, you know, pull it out of the universe, grab it, put it, you know, frame it, and sell it. I'm not there as a avenging angel of the arts. <laughs> I'm there to try and find some kind of window into some kind of song on some kind of artist, whether it was Armored Saint or Christina Aguilera or Snow Patrol. And catch it and put it in my little plastic bag and bring it out to the world and sell it. Now, when I go home and I put on, you know, whatever record I happen to be listening to, uh, the last record I listened to was the second piano concerto by, by Brahms. And I'll listen to it and I'll get lost in that. Like, when it comes to music with me, it's a religion. No one can fuck with it, no one can touch it, penetrate it, dilute it. It is completely holy, just like somebody's personal religion. It, it is absolutely in cement. But when it comes to records, I'm ready to, I'm ready to, to, to bob and weave. It's commerce. I mean, it's, not just, it's not that it's commerce, because I, you know, I have a, a high standard for, for the things I'm trying to do, but it's, it's, a, it's not the same. Like, well, I'm not trying to avenge musical righteousness when I'm cutting a record. Well, and like, I, like Black Veil Brides. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're fucking amazing. That mm -hmm. shit is great. What they're expressing and the way they're, they're independent records, what they're expressing, uh, you know, the crunchy metal, glam, Motley Crue throwback shit, like it's still like, that's to me every bit as valid as, uh, as Guapale or, you know, um, Adele. But ultimately you're trying to bring your personal ethos and how you see it and make sure it, it tries to work for those records as an A&R person. Well, uh, n not my personal taste. Not, I, not always, personal I stand taste. behind the artist and try and see the world through their eyes, not through my eyes. But don't you keep a standard that you want to try to hit? Uh, Isn't that what you just referred to? I, a, a standard of presentation. Right. That's what I'm yes, talking about. Yes, an is, impact which, standard. Which is your interpretation. Yeah. Uh, how hard I want something to hit mm -hmm. when they put the record on. Right. But it could be like... You know, it could be any kind of music. That's why. That's why you can't pin me down. You know, I did. I did Keisha Cole and Snow Patrol at the same time. Drew, tee us up another. Yeah, that was from uh, James Sanford, by the way, and also from Two Radic. Question for Ron Fair: What do you pay most attention to when listening to the demo songs you receive? I'm sorry. What do you pay attention to the most uh, with the demo songs you receive? What I pay the attention to the most? Yeah. Um. The first thing I do when I listen to a demo, it depends if it's an artist or a song, whatever, but the first thing, because to, 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 to get involved in a song or in an act or in an idea, to buy the pitch, in other words, you have to make time in your life. You have to really have, you can't, you can't just, you can't do this uh, uh, passively. So I have three children, I have, you know, things that very, things are very important and beautiful life that I, that I lead at home. So if I'm listening to a demo, the first thing I, my filter says to me is, is this something I'm going to make time in my life for? That I'm going to push other, something else aside, like not do the laundry or not watch you know, uh, Toy Story 3 for the millionth time so that I can deal with this thing that somebody just pitched me. And, if it, and it, so it's really got to hit me hard. If it's a stretch like, 
well, this could be that, it could be that, and then, and then. If I, you know, if I get my rectus set out and my science experiment and puts a little sun, it, it's got to really hit me hard for whatever, whatever the pitch is. Not unlike pitching a movie or, you know, pitching a story or pitching a baseball. It's got to hit hard. That's good. we got a segment called Batter's Box, so <laughs> remember, that, remember that metaphor. Can I talk about one more? Sure. Okay, cool. Uh, from Bass. I'm a firm believer that breaking new acts via movie soundtrack might be a way people could or should go into. I'm interested in knowing what might be an obstacle and how we'd go about it as far as breaking an artist on a soundtrack. Okay, well, the only obstacle is that every other artist, everybody else in, on the planet s thinks the same thing. I mean, we're living in an age where television became radio, where the music that's played on Gossip Girl and 90210 becomes hits of their own they, that generate sales, that create fans. So the visual hookup between not just music video, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the entire visual hookup between music and, and visual is that's the, um, that's the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's the most desirable thing. That's why the stars of The Voice and American Idol and all that, because of the visual that adds another component, a backstory, it makes it much more compelling. Like the, the, the days of, here's a girl with a song on the radio, rub two sticks together and pray for rain. Gone. I don't think so. Gone. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I don't want to do that. That's just Say that, that again. <laughs> Say that again. It's I, on tape. You rewind it. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty mind boggling. I will. Give, me a, give, give him an easy one, man. Give yeah, yeah, hard ones. Give I got you. <laughs> we have some good questions. Uh, Dirk Richter. Ron, can you describe the process of choosing sounds, samples, instruments for a song when producing? Um, a song to a song. Like how you, whatever you well, start off to choose for an artist. It's, kind of uh, it's actually something that I don't put a huge priority on. Um, which is interesting, it's probably because of the way I produce records. Now, when I'm, when I'm working in collaboration with other producers, which is what I do a lot, I leave it to them. It's like, they chose that snare drum for a reason, it must be good. I don't put my ear on it. Because I, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a victim of being the age I am, and I come from, you know, when we used to put an SM57 on a snare drum, and that was the sound. So, uh, I don't really, to me, the things that, when I, at, at my level, how I produce records, I usually do it in collaboration with other guys who are more responsible for choosing the sounds. The younger guys have a better feel for like, oh, this synth, this patch, that's the shit. I'm not creating records from that point of view. My thing is more the arrangement, the voice leading, the transitions, the emotion, the impact, the lyric, the background vocals. Um, so the choosing of the sound collage and the creating of the sound collage is that's something that I delegate. Quick footnote: You guys Google voice leading. I want you to figure out what that is because uh, that's Ron just kind of said that in <laughs> passing, but that could be like five shows, right, Ron? Probably, yeah. Five. I mean, uh, it's why Bach, why Johann Sebastian Bach is great. Is yeah. because of voice leading. It's like what note follows what note follows what note as it goes from section to section. Yeah. So you know the if the the mo probably the most potent thing in any song is that how the bass line uh, interweaves with the melody being sung. Even if it's some bonehead record like Kiss Me Through the Phone, the the these things when you break them down they have like magic ingredients. Even on the most simplistic levels of catchiness. Or, you know, because there's just as much validity to, to, you know, to Duke Ellington as there is a how much is that doggy in the window. It's all, you know, there's a lid for every pot when you're doing records. Wow. Man, it's just, and, and at the end of the day, you, you just go follow your taste. I mean, all the, all the technical stuff gets you to the point where you've got taste, and then it's that taste that you execute in the process. And I'm also a victim of it, because when I hear, like, right now the sound of radio the heavily auto-tuned vocals that are on so many songs, um, it's real turnoff to me. It's like, I'm not interested anymore. I don't, that's just not what I want to be when I grow up, you yeah. know? Yep. And then a record like Adele will come along, which is su such a bellwether of change. It's like when Alicia Keys came along. Mm -hmm. And like it was like, whoa, yeah, I remember that. Real singing, real playing, real soul, really stripped down. Isn't this great? 
So it's just been so long since somebody like Adele has been able to get onto onto the radio. Could have, could have, could have, uh, we ask this all the time, and I apologize, but could Adele have happened in America? I mean, that's the, is is the yeah. American system such that it, it's prejudiced against something like that? There's a lot of ambulance chasing, where people are running after the accident, you know, <laughs> uh, and it's and it's a and, and, and the economics are terrible. It costs so much money to, to produce and promote and, and, you know, play in the record game. And it's so crowded. There's 10 million bands on MySpace. And MySpace is, you know, already maybe has seen its better days. But there's 10 million bands. You told me once now, is it still accurate that it takes you about 3 million bucks to, uh, to really get a, a, a pop, pop record? A pop, yeah, a pop act, a couple million. A couple million. By the time you make the record... That's for you know, a new do artist. do the showcases, tour it, you know, make the video, get you know, really uh, do the groundwork, the promotional work, the meet and greet work, the you know, the Mall of America, all the things you have to do to get stuff out and get the word out, and and, and it's a big country. We do this section. It's called Batters Bites. Can you stick around? It's a real yeah, quick yeah. section, okay? Let's introduce our man, Craig Burbage. Craig, I see Craig. Hey, um, Craig, say hello to Ron Fair. One of the world's great engineers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> forgot to push the oh, mic man. button. <laughs> man, thanks, Ron. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, last time we talked, I was in Taiwan. And uh, I'm telling you, Dave, if you want to start a religion, you have about a thousand followers over there right now. In China? In China, in Taipei. They love you. They watch you religiously. They, they just listen to every word. I mean, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to visit over there, but it is just exciting over there. Those those uh, pictures you sent me of every, of like all the little, and all the all the big time engineers sitting around a monitor watching our show that that was humbling. Yeah, uh, there were a couple producers in there too. I mean, um, they, they're serious about what they're doing over there. They're really excited about their industry. Um, they have a very healthy live show or live concert thing going on over there. So uh, it's a vibrant industry. They're learning a lot, and they want to learn a lot. So your program is, like, perfect for them. They're learning production. All the stuff Ron talked about, I guarantee you there are going to be, like, 10,000 Chinese guys just hanging on every word that Ron said. Well, let's give them something to hang on from your words. You ready to do this? I'm ready to do it. Okay. For those of you that don't know, I'm going to toss out a... a uh, an instrument or a track, and Craig's going to give us his go-to choice uh, for equalizer and compression in uh, uh, plugins. Lead vocals. Lead vocals, uh, depending on the male or female, but generally, uh, if I have access to a M49 or an M50, that's a Neumann. Mm -hmm. uh, my pre it would be great if they had a Grace and an Avalon uh, E55 and a uh, LA2. Or if they don't have that, it'd be great to have the uh, the uh, Manly Vox Box. Works great. Um, That's more than one. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, acoustic guitar. Oh, man. Acoustic guitar. <coughs> KM84. Um, actually, two mics. KM84 and, like, a, again, an M49 or an M50. Piano? Um, piano? Acoustic piano? Piano. Okay, there we go. Um, it's it's a new co it's an old company uh, DMP mics, stereo um, stereo pair, and then a eighty seven on the bottom end. Overheads for drums. Overheads and drums. Sheps use those Sheps a lot. Love oh. those Sheps. Cool, and uh, kick drums. Kick drums, three microphones. I use. Give me, the, your uh, give, me, give me your best one. Give me your best one. My audience ain't that bright. They can't remember three. Yeah, they can. Okay. Um, beta 52 on, on the outside. That, the only mic you got, Beta 52, you're going to get that rock kick drum. And then, of course, a sub kick, which a Yamaha or just the, uh, you know, a Yamaha speaker in front of it. Uh, you didn't talk about compressors or EQs. We'll, we'll go back and do that another day. Snares. All right. Snares, 57 or a 58. Sure, 58. Can't beat it. Um, I've actually tried uh, 414s with a 
10 dB pad or 20 dB pad, depending on the snare. Okay. Uh, room mics. Room mics. Um, I have really no preference there. Uh, as any mic that gives a good omni omnidirectional. Uh, I don't use pattern mics. I use an omnidirectional on the room. Uh, bass. Bass guitar. Bass guitar. Um, microphone. Uh, 47 FET. Really? Cool. You know what? Take a second and go a little longer. Uh, 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 what's, the, what's the dude from Journey? Steve Perry? Yeah. You did his solo albums. Um, right. Um, how, like, what, what's your go-to setup for like rock guitars? Well, I didn't actually record his guitars. I did mostly just the mix and the vocals. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure who did his, his guitars, to be honest with you. But you know, generally speaking, you want 47, uh, 57, and uh, you know. Uh, a 47 fed and a 57 sure you know on the mics and then a room mic if you want cool mode d craig go back to the kick drum you said use a yamaha speaker for the sub explain yeah. that to our guys because i don't i don't think a lot a lot of, a lot of people know what you're talking about well a lot of people are using sub kicks uh, which is basically a, a speaker that's been wired like a microphone in other words instead of you know, hooking it up to an amplifier, you use it as a microphone, you wire it, bring it into a mic pre, and then you uh, record it on drums. The, the, the speaker itself acts as a diaphragm, and it moves with the kick drum, not as effectively as a, a microphone, but effective enough to give the sub-frequencies on, the, on mm -hmm. a kick drum. Have you done that, Ron? Have you heard of that? You know what? This is funny, because uh, we always triple mic you know the engineers that I always they, whenever we do live drums I always triple mic them near far and the sub kick and then when we bring them to you to mix them you chuck them all and put your own kick in it anyway <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's again it's one of those things where if really on my on my records if people are listening to the kick drum I failed because yeah. I've, I've they gotta be listening to the song so yeah. I, I kinda delegate that department at this point in my life there was a time when I really cared about the kick drum but at this point in my life it's not my. It's not something of great interest to me. But you, you, not just you. All the mixers throw the kick out. It's the first thing they do is they put their their best one in. Well, to defend myself here, Ron, <laughs> I, your, I your add to the kick. Yeah, I don't yeah. throw it out. I just kind of add. <laughs> and then who's the guy that sent me the Black Eyed Peas kick on every song? Well, well I, I always I, I try and beat you to the punch, right? Okay. Yeah. I've got that a Black Eyed Peas kick. I've got the one the original one from Poison by Bell Biv DeVoe, which was probably yours. Yeah. And uh, and one from Angry Mike, and um, and I just don't even listen to him anymore. I don't even know if there's a kick drum on half the records I made. Well, you know what, Tricky Stewart's all like that. Tricky Tricky is, is, is would always come in. I think I mentioned this on an earlier show and tell Jason, I this ain't about the drums. Turn those drums down. It's about the song. And, <laughs> and, and, and I think that's why you, why you and he have kind of a camaraderie I did together. Well for him. Craig, so in, in when you were in China. I know this happened to you because I know I know your skill level. When you were recording vocals and you would just not understand a word, but you'd put the delays on the right words intuitively, did they freak out? No. I'm, well, I'm, yes, they actually do. They actually think I speak Chinese. Yeah. Because I get a lot of the phrasing and the mixing right. But you know what? Like Ron was saying, there's a universality to music that 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 you just kind of know which words are supposed to do what at what part of the song. And they study us. I mean, they study our music so well. I mean, especially R&B music, you know, your records, Ron's record, they study. They really want to understand how we get that feel, how we get that, you know. Um, they're very sensitive to what we're doing. They're, really, they're honoring what we're doing. They're studying it, and, uh, but they're making it their own, too. So it's kind of exciting. Craig, I know I recognize you at your home studio. Just a lot of... A lot of our viewers are confused about what monitors to get. You've tried them all. Just I, I, there's no right or wrong. Can you give me your opinion of a cat that's trying to get a little home, not a little, but get a, a private studio like like you've got some ad monitor advice? Well, you know, Ron was telling me about a KRK. Uh, what's the ones you gave me? KRK 8Ts. 
Hey, they're good. They're incredible. I, I use them every day. Really? Yeah. I have a couple of E6s here. Um, I mean, I've been collecting, I guess, speakers, but uh, we all have the NS10s. Uh, I don't. They don't make the NS10s anymore. So um, I haven't yet to find a replacement for the NS10s. But I also use Dyne Audios, which I love. What's the um, new model? You got a, you got some new Dyne Audios. What's that model? They well, sound the new great. Old, they're they're A12s or A15s. Sorry, um, they're passive. Uh, they make self-powered that are awesome and great. Uh, the five A's, which are only under a thousand dollars for a pair, um, I use those a lot when I'm in Taipei and in China. They have them all over there. Um, I mean, it's a great time, you know, sure. for people to start their own studios because they're making really good speakers. And that comes from a cat that owned one of the best studios around, the old Yamaha Air LA Dude, studios. Dude, when I saw you and Herb, I'm going, man, I miss being able to walk out the door and go down the hall and just bother you guys. <laughs> you know? It's a long week around here. Absolutely. Uh, I miss the I miss seeing you guys every day and and the coffee and the camaraderie, but you know it's a different world we live in. Well, Craig, due to due to new stringent FCC regulations, we're going <laughs> to <have, laughs> there is no FCC. It's the damn internet, man. We're going to move on, but will you come back and and uh, you you've got some incredible uses of plugins because you're you you've got that kind of mind. Uh, will, will you come back and share some of that with us at some point I soon? I'd love to, man. And this is an important program, and everybody over in China appreciates it. I appreciate it. I learn something new every time. You know, keep up the good work, and if there's anything I can do to help, I'm there. Thanks, Craig. Just as one little quick passing note, uh, when I moved here from Atlanta, Craig was the first engineer I, I went to and said, hey, man, if you got any overflow, can you help me out? And he should have kicked me out of the studio, but he was polite enough to me. And uh, my first hit record came out of, came out of his studio. And Craig mentored me a little bit, helped me out, and uh, those were fun times. Well, Ron, we all learn. We uh, all learn from Barney Perkins, of course. Oh yeah, <laughs> we got to do a show on Barney because he's probably Love the, to. he's probably the, the one of the most important engineers out there for a number of reasons. Yes. Uh, can you come back, please, at sure, some point? I, I mean. I, I, got more to talk about. <laughs> I didn't even get through one page of notes, and uh, uh, I want you guys at home to rewind this because there's so much information there. I'm, trust me, uh, I'm the engineer I am because of some of the things Ron said today. So I want you guys to make sure that you 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 truly spend time with what he said, and then when he comes back, we'll expand on some of that. Ron will end up doing a five or six parter. We're <laughs> going we're to keep, listen, we're not far from your neighborhood, so it's okay. easy. Hey, we'll come to you sometimes. Too. Somebody asked on the questions, they asked about my hat. Mm -hmm. It's funny because this one, it's like it broke, mm -hmm. and I stitched it and glued it, and it is the most ghetto of all the hats I have. It's and character, it's, and everybody's feeling this hat. Yeah, you know that commercial, um, <laughs> the the the, uh, the Dos Equis commercial. You know that you know like he's he he's the most interesting man in the world. Mm -hmm. I actually would go to the Grammys not because I cared about him, just to see what Ron's hat was going to be like. Uh, I can describe uh, him. The, the white hat with the big feather. No, listen, had a bird in it. Listen, Ron, it was a I, bird? Yeah, I had Ron a bird. I go back to a RCA RCA bird. New York. <laughs> I can still see his office right down from Rovner's. And but Ron he is was most, madly dressed Ron back is then. the most interesting man in the world. Ron, actually, I'm not going to embarrass him, but it was a, an but event that should have been formal attire, and Ron comes back to the studio to finish a mix in shorts with a with a sport coat that matched. And I'm like, Ron, that was a funeral, dude. Uh, and he uh, denies that to this day, but it was this kind of thing, but yeah, that's right. sucker. I, yeah, that's right. It's a suit. Sartorial splendor. That's right. <laughs> the Bo Brummel of the business. Absolutely, absolutely. Hey, uh, let us redo our, uh, remind you about our Avid giveaway. Will, I think you have some stuff to run to show how people can walk through it and get to that. They're going to go to the Avid website. You see it up on the page. It's rolling. Yeah. There's that beautiful Pro Tools 9 that you're going to get. Um, who's that guy? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I but, love Zan did that. But that's how you walk through it. That's how you get to it. And uh, you enter on Twitter uh, and go to the Avid website. We're going to be doing this once a week for about five weeks. So uh, thanks to Avid. Thanks for all, all the stuff that you're doing. And follow instructions like you generally do. We'll see the comments on Facebook and everything else. And uh, we're rock and roll. Yeah, I want to, uh, you know, uh, I want to thank Avid and Vintage King and um, 
BAE, all the people that kind of help with some of the expenses for this for this thing. And we only pick people to help us out that, that you guys love and that we respect and love. And, and they're all very generous and come to the show with things to give away because I know you guys are a bunch of cheap bastards out there and want free stuff. I, I can't believe that you guys, we had so many on the BAE, the, the, the thing. So we've got uh, some stuff coming up that you're going to be real excited about in terms of the giveaways and this one is one of my favorites and, and they're, they're coming they're bringing us more stuff too right absolutely cool am i giving the plot away nope nope but you can stop there okay what do we do next it's, it's time to say goodbye we want to thank ron and then we're out i thanked ron about a hundred times then i'll thank well, you. I'll, I'll thank you for just thank you man. thanks ron thank you so thanks. much all right guys look uh uh, this has been a special moment for me. I hope you can feel that. And uh, we're going to get Ron back. Uh, haven't decided who's going to be on next week yet. You got any suggestions? Yeah, I'll talk to you later about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've already made arrangements. So oh, yeah? Yeah, I just haven't told you. Oh, good. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, great show. A lot of fun. We'll see you next week. <laughs>